Rejection. Something we've all had to deal with, especially if you've had to do a technical interview at a FANG, you've definitely come accustomed to the fact that you will likely not succeed the first time you try. And this is for many reasons. Perhaps you've just learned Java or Python, and the interviewer asks you to count the number of characters in a string, and you're using Java, and for some reason you've never heard of a string buffer, because no one ever taught you about what it was in your Java 101 course, and so you just loop over the string, assuming that's the correct way to count the number of characters in the string, and then the interviewer smiles gleefully and looks at you and already knows that you know nothing about programming. And that's not even my story of being rejected by a fang, but I will share that in this video as well as talk about dealing with rejection as part of the interview process and just how to kind of go forward with it and just realize that it's a normal part and it's a great time for you to learn and get better for your next interview. So let's talk about the first time I was rejected by none other than Amazon after doing a support engineer interview process where <laughs> I totally biffed it. You know, it was one of those processes where you come in, you're kind of ready, you're excited, you, you feel nervous, you can feel it in your stomach, you just have no idea what really to expect. And you get into your first interview and the interviewer is explaining the problem. And it was great because the interviewer actually, when they were explaining it, instead of explaining it like X, Y, Z, they said X, Y, Z, which I will remember forever because I'd never heard the term Z before outside of like, you know, a high level math course. So I thought it was great. It was just a very memorable moment. But they basically asked me to create a data model for objects that could have an infinite amount of attributes. So in their case, they ended up creating object A and object B and giving it attributes X, Y, Z for one, and another one just X and Y. And they're like, well, how would you store this in a table? And I honestly froze up and probably for 20 minutes stared at the board and had no idea how to respond. And it's really funny because now I constantly actually use this very solution in terms of whenever you have an unknown amount of attributes or a custom field often is when you have to do it. In terms of designing a table, it's very common for how you actually set this up. But personally, again, never having to even come against this problem and really only understanding basic normalization of databases, I really didn't realize that what I needed to do was create probably one table for the objects and another table for essentially the fields where you had it very normalized, where each field was represented by its own individual row with a field name and a field value connecting back to your object ID. But that was a much younger me and I'm pretty sure you will all have some similar experience where you just come up against a problem that you've never seen before, you have no idea how to answer it, and it really is a great kind of awakening in terms of the fact that you have so little knowledge in programming. And by the way, we all do. Uh, that's the thing with the tech industry is it's constantly evolving, constantly changing. New design patterns and technologies are constantly coming out, whether it be serverless or whatever's going on in the ML ops space. It's just a constant learning that you have to do in order to keep up with it. And yeah, it makes interviewing very difficult and rejections very common, especially if you've never done a technical interview. And to add to the story of being rejected from Amazon, the next problem I ran into was where it was more of a softer kind of layer of the interview, where it was more behavioral, where they were asking me about what kind of SLAs I was putting into place and kind of what metrics was I using to determine what projects I was taking on. And as someone with about a year and a half of experience into the tech industry and working at a company that wasn't really technical, I had no idea what they were asking me. In fact, I'm pretty sure I even asked the question, what is an SLA? because I had never heard this term. And so this is why I often find that technical interviews can be an interesting place in terms of you figuring out what you don't know in the tech space. As much as yes, there's a lot of stuff in terms of just asking trick questions or asking data structures and algorithm questions that you might not actually apply in your day to day. There's just other things that they might ask that actually do have some pertinence and value that you might realize you've never really paid attention to. And this is normal, especially if you've been operational for a while where you're just focusing on coding and doing enough code to get the work done and maybe not enough to actually expand your knowledge. Or if you're just out of school and you haven't had experience actually doing interviews. So this is completely normal and I don't want you to be stressed out. And that's what we're going to do in this next half is just talk about, okay, now that you've been rejected, you've got that email, you've received the, sorry, we've gone with someone more experienced or sorry, you know, we've went a different direction, whatever it might be, or maybe even worse, you've gotten ghosted completely, right? Like following that interview, the recruiter said, we're going to reach out to you again in two or three days. And it's been two or three years and they still haven't sent you that email or worse. Maybe their automated system finally just kicked in and they just sent you it two or three years later, just to remind you that you failed that interview and you are a failure and made your parents very disappointed in you. But now let's talk about dealing with rejection. So as mentioned earlier, you've been rejected and it's hard not to take it personally. It's hard not to, you know, in that moment, feel hurt and emotionally kind of like, again, rejected. It, it does kind of sometimes feel very similar to maybe being in a relationship and then, you know, being rejected or broken up with because maybe you put a lot of faith into that interview. Maybe you thought like this is the one, especially if you've been interviewing or waiting for an interview for a long period of time and, you know, nothing has panned out for a while. 
And so step one is, I think, to just remember to still kind of treat the person on the other side as a human, you know, be gracious, send them a thank you email. I know it's not necessarily the thing you want to do, but it's part of the process. And I think it's a good way of just accepting it and moving on, because I think that's the biggest thing. After kind of getting over that initial shock or whatever you might feel, you know, sadness, rejection, etc. It's now kind of a point where you need to move on, right? Like that happened, you know, you probably spent some time in your brain thinking what it would be like working at something like Amazon. I, I know I did, like, even though Amazon, from what I understand, is a very difficult and, and competitive place to work, I obviously thought about like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I worked there and I was already spending time in their offices, even though I never worked for them, right? Like mentally, you're you're spending some time thinking about that job, especially if you don't have a job at the moment, or you think like this is the job for you, whatever it was, like it takes a little bit of mental separation to be like, okay, it wasn't, and now it's time to move forward. And that's really step two. It's you were rejected once, it's okay. Now go on to the next interview. Don't worry so much about this current one, it's over, that story's gone. I mean, I know some people are like overly concerned, like, oh, now this means they'll never interview me again and they've got systems to keep track of this and all of that. But I have friends who have been interviewed by companies three, four, five, or six times and been rejected multiple times. And in fact, again, I've been rejected by Amazon about one and a half times. I say one and a half because the second time it was more like, we don't want you for this position. We have another one that we wanna interview you for. So it was kind of a rejection, but it was more like you're clearly smart and could have a chance working at Amazon, but you wouldn't work out in this position, at least based off of what we believe, but we believe you'll fit out in this other one. So it's not even the end of the world with that specific company. They might still be interested in you. And in fact, I'm still getting emails from Amazon recruiters reaching out for data engineering positions. So I wouldn't be too stressed about getting rejected. Now's the time to just move forward and see what is your next task. And really your next task should be two things. One, getting more interviews, obviously, but two, taking a moment to see like, well, why were you rejected? What skills did you not have? And what can you improve on to get those skills in order to actually interview well? So for example, my Amazon interview taught me two things, which was that I needed to redive into data modeling. And two, I need to start thinking about the actual reason I was doing the work that I was doing and figuring out ways to actually describe it, like what benefits was actually adding to a company beyond just doing work that I was told. And so I started looking for opportunities to actually explain what I was doing more. Like I started creating stories more. I didn't just come into an interview unprepared or, or only having like high level story ideas. I was like looking for exact numbers that I could share and be like, oh, this is about the amount of efficiency that I you know created by either creating this website or this data pipeline. You know, this is how I improve the bottlenecks in this data pipeline. And this is how much time it saved and how much manpower it's kind of saved or reduced, whatever it might be. Like that was something that I realized I needed to think about and actually have ready when I was going into interviews. And so it really did help me grow in terms of, it really did end up showing me gaps and seeing where I could improve and seeing where I could improve even with like practical skills in my day-to-day -day work. And so that's one reason I think interviewing can be a little bit fun. I say fun only in terms of the fact that it's like an opportunity to kind of look at yourself in a mirror and see where you can actually grow, where you're weakest, where companies might expect you to be a little bit better. And I get it. Someone below in the comments is going to make some sort of comment about the fact that, you know, they ask you questions on things you'll never actually do maybe in your day-to-day -day work. And there's some truth to that. Sometimes you do have to just do a little performance and prove to them that you can actually, you know, code through their data structures and algorithms questions, despite the fact that you're mostly going to be writing CRUDs or maybe doing work that doesn't involve that as much. But one, I think there is some value knowing DSNA. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it does help you a lot in terms of thinking about that lower level of programming, especially now that we're all programming in Python, it seems, where all we have to do is import a library and everything we need to do is now just one function away which again has taken away a lot of the understanding of the underlying layer of code, but that's a discussion for a different video altogether. Now, when you inevitably get to that point where you're at an interview, you're at the whiteboard and you're frozen because you don't know the answer to the question and you already realize I'm going to be rejected because I'm already failing the very first question of the very first interview, just realize that in that moment, it's okay. It's part of the growing process. It's part of the thing that all of us had to go through. And I think I've talked to many of my friends who've dealt with it, who now have, again, jobs, whether at Workday or Amazon, Facebook, and so on. Everyone at some point has gone through this stage where they didn't know exactly what to study. They didn't know exactly what questions would be asked, even though people kind of told them. It's just hard to really crystallize the stress you'll feel <laughs> unless you're in the interview. And so getting to that point where you end up being rejected is normal. This is one of the reasons I did create that interview guide that I've talked about in the past, which I'll link below, but all that was for me was a way that I could go back, rethink about that interview, see where I was weak, and just be honest with myself. Again, take stock in what you have, and instead of worrying about the fact that I was rejected, worry about how I was going to deal with the next interview and be like, okay, well, 
in my next interview, you know, I was really weak in data modeling or I was really weak in this section of DSNA. Thank goodness I've never had to answer a dynamic programming problem, but those exist too. And so there's just so many different types of problems that you kind of need to be ready. And you also kind of need to be ready just to maybe be rejected the first or second or fifth or 10th time. It's not that strange. And it's just kind of part of that process, regardless of how much you feel like it's jumping through hoops for companies just to prove that, you know, you're really good at studying something, which is somewhat what I think of it. You know, sometimes I feel like companies just want you to show that you're determined enough to spend a ridiculous amount of time studying something that you might not even need to do on your day to day work, but you were able to do it for their interview. So they're happy. Now, whether you've been rejected already or not, you could all do me one huge favor by smashing that like button just to help the YouTube algorithm out a little bit. And yeah, do please comment if you have any questions about interviews, or maybe if you're more experienced out there, please share your interview experiences, you know, talk about your failures, talk about your successes, or even start a discussion on how you hate the whole interview process and how you think it should be completely changed. Whatever it might be, have that conversation below and I would love to join in. And with that guys, I just wanna say thanks so much for watching this video. Again, we're pretty much at 10K at this point. It's a guaranteed thing unless for some weird reason, YouTube shuts down this channel. So I'm really thankful for all of you. I'm just perspectively looking in the future and assuming we're gonna hit 10K. So thank you all. I'll say thank you again when we do it, but I will see you next time and goodbye.